Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories. Tonight's story is Green Branches by Fiona MacLeod. This story was first published in MacLeod's collection The Sin Eater and Other Tales in 1895. Firstly, a small trigger warning. This story contains a brief scene of an attempted assault. It is unsuccessful and over in a moment, but it's not a pleasant moment. This story uses many Scottish Gaelic terms and phrases, which I will struggle to pronounce. Please bear with me. There will be English translations on screen for those words, especially when they are important to the story. There is also potential confusion about some characters' names, which I will briefly clarify. Our hero is Shamish Achana, but Achana is a kind of title, and Shamish is the Scottish version of James. He is variously referred to as Shamish, as James, or simply as Achana. And yes, his brother's name is Gloom. I hope that helps. It's a fantastic story, very creepy, and perfect for Halloween. Now, Let's open our imaginations and begin. In the year that followed the death of Manus Macodrum, James Achana saw nothing of his brother Gloom. He might have thought himself alone in the world of all his people, but for a letter that came to him out of the West. True, he had never accepted the common opinion that his brothers had both been drowned on that night when Anne Gillespie left Elianmore with Manus. In the first place, he had nothing of that inner conviction concerning the fate of gloom which he had concerning that of Marcus. In the next, had he not heard the sound of the Phaeton, which no one that he knew played except gloom, and, for further token, was not the tune that which he hated above all others, the dance of the dead. For who but Gloom would be playing that, he hating it so, and the hour being late, and no one else on a lion moor? It was no sure thing that the dead had not come back, but the more he thought of it, the more Achana believed that his sixth brother was still alive. Of this, however, he said nothing to anyone. It was as a man set free that, at last, after long waiting and patient trouble, with the disposal of all that was left of the Achana heritage, he left the island. It was a grey memory for him, the bleak moorland of it, the blight that had lain so long and so often upon the crops, the rains that had swept the isle for grey days and grey weeks and grey months, the sobbing of the sea by day and its dark moan by night, its dim relinquishing sigh in the calm of dreary ebbs, its hollow, baffling roar when the storm shadow swept up out of the sea, one and all oppressed him, even in memory. He had never loved the island, even when it lay green and fragrant in the green and white seas, under white and blue skies, fresh and sweet as an Eden of the sea. He had ever been lonely and weary, tired of the mysterious shadow that lay upon his folk, caring little for any of his brothers except the eldest, long since mysteriously gone out of the ken of man, and almost hating Gloom, who had ever borne him a grudge because of his beauty and because of his likeness to and reverent heed for Alison. Moreover, ever since he had come to love Katrine MacArthur, the daughter of Donald MacArthur, who lived in Sleet of Skye, he had been eager to live near her, the more eager as he knew that Gloom loved the girl also and wished for success not only for his own sake, but so as to put a slight upon his younger brother. So, when at last he left the island, he sailed southward gladly. He was leaving a lion more, he was bound to a new home in Skye, and perhaps he was going to his long-delayed, long-dreamed-of happiness. True, Katrine was not pledged to him. He did not even know for sure if she loved him. He thought, hoped, dreamed, almost believed that she did. But then there was her cousin Ian, who had long wooed her, and to whom old Donald MacArthur had given his blessing. Nevertheless, his heart would have been lighter than it had been for long, but for two things. First, there was the letter. 
Some weeks earlier he had received it, not recognizing the writing because of the few letters he had ever seen, and, moreover, as it was in a feigned hand. With difficulty he had deciphered the manuscript, plain printed though it was. It ran thus. Well, shamish, my brother, it is wondering if I am dead you will be. Maybe I, and maybe no. But I send you this writing to let you know that I know all you do and all you think of. So, you're going to leave a lion more without an achana upon it, and you will be going to sleet in sky. Well, let me be telling you this thing. Do not go. I see blood there. And there is this, too. Neither you nor any man shall take Katrine away from me. You know that, and Ian MacArthur knows it, and Katrine knows it, and that holds whether I am alive or dead. I say to you, do not go. It will be better for you and for all. Ian MacArthur is away in the North Sea with the whaler captain who came to us at a lion moor and will not be back for three months yet. But it will be better for him not to come back. But if he comes back, he will have to reckon with the man who says that Katrine MacArthur is his. I would rather not have two men to speak to, and one my brother. It doesn't matter to you where I am. I want no money just now, but put aside my portion for me. Have it ready for me against the day I call for it. I will not be patient that day, so have it ready for me. In the place that I am, I am content. You will be saying, why is my brother away in a remote place? I will say this to you, that it is not further north than St. Kilda, nor further south than the Mole of Cantyre. And for what reason? That is between me and silence. But perhaps you think of Anne sometimes. Do you know that she lies under the green grass? And of Manus Macodrum? They say that he swam out to sea and was drowned, and they whisper of the seal blood, though the minister is wrath with them for that. He calls it a madness. Well, I was there at that madness, and I played to it on my faden. And now, Shamish, can you be thinking of what the tune was that I played? Your brother, who awaits his own day, gloom, P.S. Do not be forgetting this thing. I would rather not be playing the damson amar. It was an ill hour for Manus when he heard the Dan Naron. It was the song of his soul that, and yours is the damson amar. This letter was ever in his mind. This and what happened in the gloaming when he sailed away for sky in the herring smack of two men who lived at Armandale in Sleet. For, as the boat moved slowly out of the haven, one of the men asked him if he was sure that no one was left upon the island, for he thought he had seen a figure on the rocks waving a black scarf. Achana shook his head, but just then his companion cried that at that moment he had seen the same thing, So the smack was put about, and when she was moving slowly through the haven again, Achana sculled ashore in the little cogly punt. In vain he searched here and there, calling loudly again and again. Both men could hardly have been mistaken, he thought. If there were no human creature on the island, and if their eyes had not played them false, who could it be? The wraith of Marcus, perhaps. Or might it be the old man himself, his father, risen to bid farewell to his youngest son, or to warn him? It was no use to wait longer, so, looking often back behind him, he made his way to the boat again and rowed slowly out toward the smack. Jerk, jerk, jerk. Across the water came, low, but only too loud for him, the opening motif of the Damsana Namarv. A horror came upon him, and he drove the boat through the water so that the sea splashed over the bows. When he came up on deck, he cried in a hoarse voice to the men next to him to put up the helm and let the smack swing to the wind. There is no one there, Callum Campbell, he whispered. 
and who is that will be making that strange music? What music? Sure, it has stopped now, but I heard it clear, and so did Andrew McEwen. It was like the sound of a reed pipe, and the tune was an eerie one at that. It was the dance of the dead. And who will be playing that? asked the man, with fear in his eyes. No living man. No living man? No. I'm thinking it will be one of my brothers who was drowned here, and by the same token that it is a gloom, for he played upon the Phaedon. But if not, then... then... The two men waited in breathless silence, each trembling with superstitious fear, but at last the elder made a sign to Etana to finish. Then it will be the Kelpie. Is there... is there one of the cave women here? It is said, and you know of old that the Kelpie sings or plays a strange tune to while a seamen to their death. At that moment the fantastic, jerking music came loud and clear across the bay. There was a horrible suggestion in it, as if dead bodies were moving along the ground with long jerks and crying and laughing wild. It was enough. The men, Campbell and McEwen, would not now have waited longer if Atrana had offered them all he had in the world. Nor were they, or he, out of their panic haste till the smack stood well out to sea and not a sound could be heard from a lionmore. They stood, watching silent. Out of the dusky mass that lay in the seaward way to the north came a red gleam. It was like an eye staring after them with blood-red glances. What is that, Achana? It looks as though a fire had been lighted in the house up in the island. The door and the window must be open. The fire must be fed with wood, for no peats would give that flame, and there were none lighted when I left. To my knowing, there was no wood for burning except the wood of the shelves and the bed. And who would be doing that? I know of that no more than you do, Callum Campbell. No more was said, and it was a relief to all when the last glimmer of the light was absorbed in the darkness. At the end of the voyage, Campbell and McEwen were well pleased to be quit of their companion, not so much because he was moody and distraught as because they feared that a spell was upon him, a fate in the working of which they might become involved. It needed no vow of the one to the other for them to come to the conclusion that they would never land on a lion moor, or, if need be, only in broad daylight, and never alone. The days went well for James at Chana, where he made his home at Ranza Beag, on Ranza Water in the Sleet of Sky. The farm was small, but good, and he hoped that with help and care he would soon have the place as good a farm as there was in all sky. Donald MacArthur did not let him see much of Katrine, but the old man was no longer opposed to him. Shamish must wait till Ian MacArthur came back again, which might be any day now. For sure, James Achana of Ranza Beag was a very different person from the youngest of the Achana folk who held by on lonely Alionmore. Moreover, the old man could not but think with pleasure that it would be well to see Katrine able to walk over the whole land of Ranza, from the cairn at the north of his own Ranza moor to the burn at the south of Ranza Beag, and know it for her own. But Achana was ready to wait. Even before he had the secret word of Katrine, he knew from her beautiful dark eyes that she loved him. As the weeks went by, they managed to meet often, and at last Katrine told him that she loved him too, and would have none but him, but that they must wait till Ian came back, because of the pledge given to him by her father. They were days of joy for him. Through many a hot noontide hour, through many a gloaming, he went as one in a dream. Whenever he saw a birch swaying on the wind, or a wave leaping from Loch Lath that was near his home, or past a bush covered with wild roses, or saw the moonbeams lying white on the boles of the pines, he thought of Katrine, his fawn for grace, and so lithe and tall, with sunbrown face and wavy dark mass of hair and shadowy eyes and rowan red lips. 
It is said that there is a god clothed in shadow who goes to and fro among the human kind, putting silence between lovers with his waving hands and breathing a chill out of his cold breath and leaving a gulf of deep water flowing between them because of the passing of his feet. That shadow never came their way. Their love grew as a flower fed by rains and warmed by sunlight. When midsummer came and there was no sign of Ian MacArthur, it was already too late. Katrine had been won. During the summer months, it was the custom for Katrine and two of the farm girls to go up to Mayol Ranza and reside at the sheeling of Nock and Frug, and this because of the hill pasture for the sheep. Nock and Frug is a round, boulder-studded hill covered with heather, which has a precipitous quarry on each side, and in front slopes down to Loch and Frug, a lochlet surrounded by dark woods. Behind the hill, or great hillock rather, lay the sheeling. At each weekend, Katrine went down to Ransom Moor, and on every Monday morning at sunrise returned to her heather-girt eyrie. It was on one of those visits that she endured a cruel shock. Her father told her that she must marry someone else than Shamish Achana. He had heard words about him which made a union impossible, and indeed he hoped that the man would leave Ranza Beek. In the end he admitted that what he had heard was to the effect that Achana was under a doom of some kind, that he was involved in a blood feud, and, moreover, that he was fey. The old man would not be explicit as to the person from whom his information came, but hinted that it was a stranger of rank, probably a laird of the Isles. Besides this, there was word of Ian MacArthur. He was at Thurso, in the far north, and would be in Skye before long, and he, her father, had written to him that he might wed Katrine as soon as was practicable. "'Do you see that linty yonder, father?' was her response to this. Ay, lass, and what about the birdeen? Well, when she mates with a hawk, so will I be mating with Ian MacArthur, but not till then. With that she turned and left the house, and went back to Noch on Frug. On the way she met Achana. It was that night, for the first time, he swam across Loch and Frug to meet Katrine. The quickest way to reach the sheeling was to row across the locklet and then ascend by a sheep path that wound through the hazel copses at the base of the hill. Fully half an hour was thus saved because of the steepness of the precipitous quarries to right and left. A boat was kept for this purpose, but it was fastened to a shore boulder by a padlocked iron chain, the key of which was kept by Donald MacArthur. Latterly, he had refused to let this key out of his possession. For one thing, no doubt, he believed he could thus restrain Achana from visiting his daughter. The young man could not approach the sheeling from either side without being seen. But that night, soon after the moon was whitening slow in the dark, Katrine stole down to the hazel copse and awaited the coming of her lover. The lochen was visible from almost any point on Knock on Froch, as well as from the south side. To cross it in a boat unseen, if any watcher were near, would be impossible, nor could even a swimmer hope to escape notice, unless in the gloom of night, or, mayhap, in the dusk. When, however, she saw, halfway across the water, a spray of green branches slowly moving athwart the surface, she knew that Shamish was keeping his tryst. If, perchance, anyone else saw, he or she would never guess that those derelict rowan branches shrouded Shamish Achana. It was not until the astray had drifted close to the hedge, where, hid among the bracken and the hazel undergrowth, she awaited him, that Katrine described the face of her lover, as, with one hand, he parted the green sprays and stared longingly and lovingly at the figure he could just discern in the dim, fragrant obscurity. And as it was on this night, so it was many of the nights that followed. Katrine spent the days as in a dream. Not even the news of her cousin Ian's return disturbed her much. One day the inevitable meeting came. 
She was at Ranzo Moor, and when a shadow came into the dairy where she was standing, she looked up and saw Ian before her. She thought he appeared taller and stronger than ever, though still not so tall as Shamish, who would appear slim besides the Herculean skyman. But, as she looked at his close curling black hair and thick bull neck and the sullen eyes in his dark, wind-red face, she wondered that she had ever tolerated him at all. He broke the ice at once. "'Tell me, Katrine, are you glad to see me back again?' I'm glad that you are home once more, safe and sound. And will you make it my home for me by coming to live with me, as I've asked you again and again? No, as I've told you again and again. He gloomed at her angrily for a few moments before he resumed. I will be asking you this one thing, Katrine, daughter of my father's brother. Do you love that man, Achana, who lives at Ranza Beeg? You may ask the wind why it is from the east or the west, but it won't tell you. You are not the wind's master. If you think I will let this man take you away from me, you are thinking a foolish thing. And you saying a foolisher. I? Ah, sure. What could you do, Ian McKeon? Ah, the worst you could do no more than kill James Achana. What then? I too would die. You cannot separate us. I would not marry you now, though you were the last man in the world and I the last woman. You are a fool, Katrine MacArthur. Your father has promised you to me, and I tell you this. If you love Achana, you'll save his life only by letting him go away from here. I promise you he will not be here long. Ah, you promise me. But you will not say that thing to James Achana's face. You're a coward. With a muttered oath, the man turned on his heel. Let him beware of me, and you too, Katrine Moni and Don. I swear it by my mother's grave and by St. Martin's cross that you will be mine, by hook or by crook. The girl smiled scornfully. Slowly she lifted a milk pail. It would be a pity to waste the good milk, Ian Garax, but if you don't go, it is I that will be empty in the pail on you, and then you will be as white without as your heart is within. So you call me witless, do you? Ian Gorach? Well, we'll be seeing as to that. And as for the milk, there will be more than milk spilt because of you, Katrine Don. From that day, though neither Shamish nor Katrine knew it, a watch was set upon Achana. It could not be long before their secret was discovered, and it was with a savage joy overmastering his sullen rage that Ian MacArthur knew himself the discoverer and conceived his double vengeance. He dreamed gloatingly on both the black thoughts that roamed like ravenous beasts through the solitudes of his heart but he did not dream that another man was filled with hate because of Katrine's lover, another man who had sworn to make her his own, the man who, disguised, was known in Armandale as Donald MacLean, and, in the Northern Isles, would have been hailed as Gloom Achana. There had been steady rain for three days, with a cold, raw wind. On the fourth the sun shone and set in peace. An evening of quiet beauty followed, warm, fragrant, dusky from the absence of moon or star, though the thin veils of mist promised to disperse as the night grew. There were two men that eve in the undergrowth on the south side of the lochlet. Shamish had come earlier than his wont. Impatient for the dusk, he could scarce await the waning of the afterglow. Surely, he thought, he might venture. Suddenly his ears caught the sound of cautious footsteps. Could it be old Donald, perhaps with some inkling of the way in which his daughter saw her lover in despite of all? Or, mayhap, might it be Ian MacArthur, tracking him as a hunter stalking a stag by the water pools? He crouched and waited. In a few minutes he saw Ian carefully picking his way. The man stopped as he described the green branches, smiled as, with a low rustling, he raised them from the ground. 
Meanwhile, yet another man watched and waited, though on the further side of the lochen where the hazel copses were. Gloom Achana half hoped, half feared the approach of Katrine. It would be sweet to see her again, sweet to slay her lover before her eyes, brother to him though he was. But there was chance that she might descry him, and, whether recognizingly or not, warn the swimmer. So it was that he had come there before sundown, and now lay crouched among the bracken underneath a projecting mossy ledge close upon the water, where it could scarce be that she or any should see him. As the gloaming deepened, a great stillness reigned. There was no breath of wind. A scarce audible sigh prevailed among the spires of the heather. The churring of a nightjar throbbed through the darkness. Somewhere a corncrake called its monotonous creak, creak, the dull, harsh sound emphasizing the utter stillness. The pinging of the gnats hovering over and among the sedges made an incessant murmur through the warm, sultry air. There was a splash once, as of a fish, then silence, then a lower but more continuous splash, or rather wash of water. A slow susurrus rustled through the dark. Where he lay among the fern, Gloom Achana slowly raised his head, stared through the shadows, and listened intently. If Katrine were waiting there, she was not near. Noiselessly he slid into the water. When he rose, it was under a clump of green branches. These he had cut and secured three hours before. With his left hand he swam slowly, or kept his equipoise in the water. With his right hand he guided the heavy rowan bow. In his mouth were two objects, one long and thin and dark, the other with an occasional glitter as of a dead fish. His motion was scarcely perceptible. Nonetheless, he was near the middle of the loch almost as soon as another clump of green branches. Doubtless, the swimmer beneath it was confident that he was now safe from observation. The two clumps of green branches drew nearer. The smaller seemed a mere astray, a spray blown down by the recent gale. But all at once the larger clump jerked awkwardly and stopped. Simultaneously, a strange, low strain of music came from the other. The strain ceased. The two clumps of green branches remained motionless. Slowly, at last, the larger moved forward. It was too dark for the swimmer to see if anyone lay hid behind the smaller. When he reached it, he thrust aside the leaves. It was as though a great salmon leapt. There was a splash, and a narrow, dark body shot through the gloom. At the end of it, something gleamed. Then suddenly there was a savage struggle. The inanimate green branches tore this way and that and surged and swirled. Gasping cries came from the leaves. Again and again the gleaming thing leapt. At the third leap, an awful scream shrilled through the silence. The echo of it wailed thrice with horrible distinctness in the quarry beyond Nach and Fru. Then, after a faint splashing, there was silence once more. One clump of green branches drifted slowly up the locklet. The other moved steadily toward the place whence, a brief while before, it had stirred. Only one thing lived in the heart of Gloom Achana, the joy of his exultation. He had killed his brother Shamish. He had always hated him because of his beauty. Of late he had hated him because he had stood between him, Gloom, and Katrine MacArthur, because he had become her lover. They were all dead now except himself, all the Achanas. He was Achana. When the day came that he would go back to Galloway, there would be a magpie on the first burke, and a screaming jay on the first rowan, and a croaking raven on the first fir. I, he would be there suffering, though they knew nothing of him meanwhile. He would be Achana of Achana again. Let those who stand in his way beware. As for Katrine, perhaps he would take her there. Perhaps not. He smiled. These thoughts were the wandering fires in his brain while he slowly swam shoreward under the floating green branches and as he disengaged himself from them and crawled upward through the bracken. 
It was at this moment that a third man entered the water from the further shore. Prepared as he was to come suddenly upon Katrine, Gloom was startled when, in place of a dense shadow, a hand touched his shoulder, and a voice whispered, Shamish! Shamish! The next moment she was in his arms. He could feel her heart beating against his. What is it, Shamish? What was that awful cry? she whispered. For answer, he put his lips to hers and kissed her again and again. The girl drew back. Some vague instinct warned her. What is it, Shamish? Why don't you speak? He drew her close again. Pulse of my heart, it is I who love you. I who love you best of all. It is I, Gloom Achana. With a cry, she struck him full in the face. He staggered, and in that moment she freed herself. You coward! Katrine, I... Come no nearer. If you do, it will be the death of you. The death of me? Ah, a bonny fool that you are, and it is you that will be the death of me? I gloom Tana, for I have but to scream, and Shamish will be here, and he would kill you like a dog if he knew you did me harm. Ah, but if there were no Shamish, or any man to come between me and my will... Then there would be a woman. I, if you overborne me, I would strangle you with my hair or fix my teeth in your false throat. I was not for knowing you were such a wild cat, but I'll tame you yet, my lass. Ah, <laughs> wild cat. And as he spoke, he laughed low. It is a true word, gloom of the black heart. I am a wild cat, and, like a wild cat, I am not to be seized by a fox, and that you will be finding to your cost by the holy Saint Bridget. But now, off with you, brother of my man. Your man, ha! <laughs> Why do you laugh? Sure, I am laughing at a warm, white lass like yourself, having a dead man as your lover. Ah. Uh. A dead man. No answer came. The girl shook with a new fear. Slowly she drew closer till her breath fell warm against the face of the other. He spoke at last. I, a dead man. It is a lie. Where would you be that you were not here in his goodbye? I'm thinking it was loud enough. It is a lie. It is a lie. No, it is no lie. Shamish is cold enough now. He's low among the weeds by now. I by now. Down there in the lochen. What, you... You devil! Is it for killing your own brother you would be? I killed no one. He died his own way. Maybe the cramp took him. Maybe... Maybe a kelpie gripped him. I watched. I saw him beneath the green branches. He was dead before he died. I saw it in the white face of him. Then he sank. He's dead. Shamish is dead. Look here, girl. I've always loved you. I swore the oath upon you. You're mine. Sure you're mine now, Katrine. It is loving you I am. It will be a south wind for you from this day, Morneen McCree. See here, I'll show you how I... Back! Back! Murderer! Be stopping that foolishness now, Katrine MacArthur. By the book, I am tired of it. I'm loving you, and it's having you for mine I am. And if you won't come to me like the dove to its mate, I'll come to you like the hawk to the dove. With a spring he was upon her. In vain she strove to beat him back. His arms held her as a stoat grips a rabbit. He pulled her head back and kissed her throat till the strangulating breath sobbed against his ear. With a last despairing effort, she screamed the name of the dead man. Shamish! 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 The man who struggled with her laughed. I call away. The heron will be coming through the bracken as soon as Shamish comes to your call. That is mine you are now, Katrine. He's dead and cold, and you'd best have a living man, and... She fell back. 
her glance lost in the sudden realizing. What did it mean? Gloom still stood there, but as one frozen. Through the darkness she saw, at last, that a hand gripped his shoulder. Behind him a black mass vaguely obtruded. For some moments there was absolute silence, then a hoarse voice came out of the dark. You will be no one now who it is, Gloom Achan. The voice was that of Shamesh, who lay dead in the Lachen. The murderer shook as in a palsy. With a great effort, slowly he turned his head. He saw a white splash, the face of the corpse, and in this white splash flamed two burning eyes, the eyes of the soul of the brother whom he had slain. He reeled, staggered as a blind man, and, free now of that awful clasp, swayed to and fro as one drunken. Slowly, Shamish raised an arm and pointed downward through the wood toward the lochen. Still pointing, he moved swiftly forward. With a cry like a beast, Gloom Achana swung to one side, stumbled, rose, and leapt into the darkness. For some minutes, Shamish and Katrine stood, silent, apart, listening to the crashing sound of his flight, the race of the murderer against the pursuing shadow of the grave. What an amazing ending! The woman and her lover standing and watching the bad guy run off, thinking he is pursued by a ghost or by death itself. It's honestly it's so strange that we don't end with some uh, recognition or reconciliation between the two of them. It feels a little bit cut off. But actually the whole story kind of has an unfinished air. It just starts in the middle and it doesn't conclude. Before the story begins, Manus and Gloom and Anne left Lionmore together, and Manus and Anne died somehow, and everybody said that Gloom was dead too. There's also a mention of the oldest brother who disappeared. Do you think that Gloom is systematically killing all his brothers so he can be a Chana? But there's also a suggestion that he particularly hates Shamish for being young and handsome and being respectful to Allison. Who the heck is Allison? Their mother, maybe? Aside from all these incomplete details, I really love this story. It's so gloomy and moody and evocative, even from the very beginning, when he talks about how he never loved his home, even when it was an Eden in the springtime. And of course not, what with your spooky, weird brother playing death marches at you, but, you know, whatever. I also want to talk briefly about the Song of the Seal. In the letter in the beginning of the story, Gloom says that he played Dan Non Ron, the Song of the Seals, to his brother Manus as he died. What is that? Ahem. Gloom says that he played Dan Nen Ron, the Song of the Seals, to his brother Manus as he died, and, quote, they whisper of the seal blood, though the minister is wrath with them for that. He implies that Manus was cursed by the Song of the Seal. It was, quote, the song of his soul, while Shamish is cursed by the dance of death. Apparently, seals can sound very much like a human, making sounds that are kind of mournful and frightening, but are also interpreted as a yearning sound, a sound of fellowship, a call from the sea. For that reason, seal song is associated with a kind of supernatural longing, you know, the, the call of the deep, and so it is kind of fey. And these almost human seal noises were also sometimes attributed to Kelpies, again with that same kind of siren song attribution, fear and yearning kind of intermingled. The way that these songs are used in the story implies that Gloom has a sort of unique torture song for each brother, a specific soundtrack for each doom. Many of the places in this story are, of course, real places, but I'm not sure about Elianmor itself. Elianmor means, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, sorry, the biggest island in a group of islands. So there are a ton of places called that on the west coast of Scotland, although it's only the proper formal name of a few places. 
The story says that this Elianmore is north of Skye, and there is this tiny lighthouse island up in the Flannan Isles, so that's what I'm imagining. You can see the map here. For lovers of true and mysterious disappearances, you will probably have heard the story of Elianmore of the Flannan Isles. It's the setting of that one lighthouse incident where the three lighthouse keepers vanished mysteriously and the clocks were stopped and breakfast was on the table and they wrote uh, in a log about a storm that never happened. For the record, that disappearance happened in 1900. And this story was published in 1895 before that lighthouse was even built. In a first for this channel, our author tonight, Fiona MacLeod, is the nom de plume of Scottish writer William Sharp. We seldom see a male writer adopt a female pseudonym. Sharp wrote stories and novels almost exclusively as MacLeod after about 1893. He only wrote nonfiction and commentary and translations as himself. He held this MacLeod persona very secret, and almost nobody knew about it before his death. When necessary, he would dictate letters as MacLeod to his sister, so they would have feminine handwriting and maintain the illusion of this identity. Apparently, he adopted this persona because he didn't get along with Yeats, and Yeats was arguably the most important figure of the Celtic revival literary movement at the time, which of course Sharp was part of. Apparently, Yeats hated Sharp's writing, but he liked MacLeod's. Sharp also used a range of pen names for other publications, so maybe that was just a thing he did. Sharp always had poor health, and he died at the age of 50, and his widow wrote a biography of him in which she tried to explain the necessity of all these different pen names and personas that he used. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that, firstly, I just spent way too much time listening to seal noises, and they are really freaking bizarre. Secondly, but much more importantly, archive.org has been down lately, and I really rely on it for the channel. This week's stories are a last-minute swap-in from Project Gutenberg, and they weren't really what I had planned for the rest of this month at all. Gutenberg is a fantastic resource, and I'm super grateful for them, but Gutenberg is really most useful when you already know what you're looking for. Archive.org makes it much easier to discover previously unknown things or chase down various rabbit holes into entirely new territory. I know I've mentioned archive.org before on the channel, but they are having a really hard time right now, and so I want to bring them up again. They just lost an appeal in a huge lawsuit against the publishing companies. I think they're still fighting it, and they want to appeal it again. They want to have the same digital rights as a physical library. When a physical library buys a book, they also get such and so many licenses to distribute uh, the book online in a digital format. So it's easy and cheap for libraries to maintain physical copies of books and digital copies of books. Archive.org, um, acting as an online library, has been similarly distributing digital versions of the books that they buy the licenses for, but the publishing industry has sued them saying that they aren't a real library and they don't have the same digital distribution rights as a library. Now, so far, the courts agree with the publishing industry that archive.org is not a library and doesn't have the same rights, and the lawsuit is costing them a ton of money. Archive.org's argument is that they act as a library for people who cannot get to a physical library or whose local library has a very limited selection of books, but they haven't been able to convince the legal system of their argument. On top of that, they've had a ton of DDoS attacks lately, as have a number of libraries. Um, people have tried to cyber attack, particularly their donor lists. So anyway, they've taken the site down in order to implement more security measures and to make themselves more robust against these kind of attacks. Um, but all of this is hugely expensive. And in addition to the sheer amount of space it takes to maintain the Wayback Machine... <sighs> So I'm a huge fan of libraries. I would never disparage them, but archive.org is a critically important resource. It is the archive of our times, and it does need our support and protection. So if you feel like clicking the link in the description and throwing them a couple bucks, future generations will thank you. And I thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. If you aren't already subscribed, you really ought to be. Please also drop me a like or a comment or both. Let me know what you think of seals and kelpies and libraries. Thank you so much for all the support, and I will see you in a few days.